It's fair to say that YouTube has been one of the main platforms for gaming content since its inception. However, if we're talking about the early 2010s, it's more accurate to say that it was the other way around. Gaming content was the platform that YouTube stood on. Before the various adpocalypses and the increasingly difficult uphill battle to monetize your videos and keep them monetized, the biggest names in the community were doing 15 minute long let's plays of whatever game was the most popular at the moment, and YouTube was happy to plaster their faces all over the site, no matter what they said. But underneath all of the overreactions to jump scares and doing funny voices for the younger demographic of viewers, there was a genre untouched by the more lowbrow tendencies of the time, a kind of content that was based on sheer gaming ability being the source of entertainment for the watcher, as opposed to what the person playing the game was doing. While there's always been very active competitive gaming scenes, the paradigm shifted once games like Call of Duty and other first-person shooters became popular, and clips of particularly extraordinary kills began being shared en masse on sites like YouTube. However, it's misleading to act like this shift happened on its own. Before montage parodies, there were montages themselves, compilations of impressive gameplay and trick shots. Sure, there were many people doing this, and some even before YouTube was a thing, but very, very few members of this community were, or ever will be, as influential as FaZe Clan. Maybe that's a name you've never heard of before, because you grew up already in the era of sugar pill short form ADHD content. Or maybe that's a name you'll hear and instantly remember memories of a bygone era. Roughly 13 years ago, on May 30th, 2010, Face Sniping was founded by three people, Eric Rivera, also known as Clips, Jeff Eman from Canada, who went by the name of House Cats, and Ben Resistance Christensen from Texas. Together, they made something of an innovation to the genre. Instead of doing trick shots solo, they worked as a team. While Clips had already uploaded a video of himself playing Halo earlier that month, it wasn't quite phase until the other two joined. Many of the cultural staples of this era and genre of online gaming content that are taken for granted as the norm were actually started or popularized by phase From the very beginning, Beginning of the Face Clan channel, they were trend setting. For example, check out this sick intro. Jungle Beats, holla at me. <laughs> The garbage 3D graphics, the Jungle Beats tag, you really can't get more 2010 than that. The upload that debuted the channel was a mini montage of kills that, compared to the kind of insane trick shots that would later become the standard, are super simple and rudimentary. Of course, the entire video looks like it was edited on iMovie, and has what sounds to me like Bring Me The Horizon dubstep playing as its soundtrack. Come to think of it, things really haven't changed that much. Can you feel the that was all just an overture though, as the upload that followed was the very first episode of the Phase Ill Cams, which now stands at over a million views. Certainly, a lot of these views came from way later, as people returned to it out of nostalgia, but even at the time the Ill Cams were uploaded, they were racking up hundreds of thousands of views, which were no small feat for the super early 2010s. Even if limited to its own little niche, Phase was already drawing people's attention, and just a few months later, two new recruits to Phase were announced. Phase Recon, and most notably Phase Temper, the latter of which has a million and a half views. As the ill cams raged on and the views kept stacking up, the channel occasionally uploaded videos dedicated to each member of Phase, and it immediately became clear that Temper was destined to be one of the protagonists of the crew from how much attention his videos got from the community. Temper, real name Thomas Oliveira, was Brazilian and just 16 years old by the time he joined Phase. A video where he wasn't even playing but just going over his gaming setup now has well over a million views. And uh, right here, he's a Turtle Beach X11s, all I use, I mean, yeah, I had X1s before, but they kind of broke it short up. This is my controller. I got FPS freaks on them. Like, these things, you just attach them on, take them off. However, his star power would soon be matched by another recent recruit, FaZe Fakey. His introduction to the team has almost 2.5 million views, which was initially driven by the fact that on his solo YouTube channel, he had already been uploading clips of his own that had gotten some attention. Later on, he would post tutorials to the FaZe channel, showing off his trickshotting acumen. It's worth noting that, at this point in time, these guys were playing on Xbox controllers instead of keyboard and mouse, which added to how impressive it was overall. Between the ill cams, temper, and fakey, FaZe was consistently making numbers, and by April of 2012, they hit 100,000 subscribers. Later on, as they noticed how particularly popular those two players were, a collaboration between them was posted and made waves, with a staggering 3 million views. Capitalizing further on the kind of content that was working, FaZe started another successful montage series called Sniping with Style, and the former seemed immune to failure. Not much later, the previously mentioned 100,000 jumped to 300,000, and as the montages graduated from Modern Warfare 2 to the recently dropped Modern Warfare 3, FaZe began taking proportions never expected by its founders. Gradually, FPS gaming and FaZe became synonymous, and in late 2012, the 
channel hit 1 million subscribers. Mind you, around the same time, PewDiePie was reaching 2 million, so having 1 million was a lot more meaningful than it is nowadays. Their success hit new records after the release of Black Ops 2, and a video they posted of the first montage featuring the game is at almost 8 million views now. In the beginning of 2013, another significant member was added to the team, FaZe Rug. While new recruits were still joining the team, it slowed down now as FaZe was already relatively famous, and everyone who was into gaming wanted in. Because of this, instead of manually looking for and handpicking the new recruits, FaZe started hosting the FaZe 5 Challenge, where people would submit their channels and montages to be evaluated and considered for recruitment. At this point, the emo music and dubstep, as well as the grimy graphics, had now given way to slightly cleaner packaging. Though very much retaining the essence of the monster-drinking PC-bound lunatic with bags under his eyes from playing through the night that composed the majority of the people watching the content. And some people, to this day, don't know who though. Shortly after, FaZe announced their line of clothing, which again, was something reserved only for the higher cast of YouTube at this point in time. The idea of YouTuber merch was insane. We can't go back in time to verify, but I'm pretty sure wearing this to LAN parties in 2013 was considered refined high fashion. FaZe was big enough for its members to afford meeting each other in real life, which they did while attending the MLG convention at Anaheim in 2013. While the gaming content was still in extremely high demand, it was around this point that vlogging was also rising in popularity on the platform. And being the keen observers they were, FaZe looked for ways to capitalize on this trend as well. In the same year, they posted another real-life video of FaZe members at the MLG convention in Columbus, Ohio. All around, this was a very active period in FaZe history. New recruits included FaZe K, FaZe Banks, and FaZe Jev. One of the ill cam was even officially endorsed, if that's the right term for it, by rapper Hoodie Allen, who allowed them to use his music. More vlogging content was experimented with, though they hadn't quite settled on the best format for it yet, with videos that documented a day in the life of a particular player, or even real-life trick shots, but in beer pong. Temper and Banks collectively decided that, to maximize the potential of FaZe, they would need to move in together to a house in New York, basically to dedicate all of their time in managing FaZe and making lifestyle content for it besides the gaming. Officially, Temper was the CEO of FaZe, while Banks Banks was the COO. Fancy way to say the second highest in the hierarchy. In mid-2014, all of the winners of the Phase 5 along with Temper participated in a vlog that essentially presented all of the new recruits, which many of the people watching took inspiration from, since many of the guys that got in were, in a lot of ways, just like them. The appeal of how relatable the team seemed was magnified by the fact that they were getting sponsors like G Fuel, and their gaming endeavors were proving more and more profitable. I mean, what could be more attractive to the 2012 teenager to young adult male demographic than getting to go on trips around the world to meet up with other avid video players just like you, all while making actual money from playing Call of Duty. It may seem commonplace now, but back then it was insane, and these guys were rock stars. Little known fact, one of their new series from this time, Face for All, had its second episode featuring none other than Scarce. The further you go back in time, the more these successful content creators occasionally clump together. Phase was functioning as a well-oiled machine and needed very little maintenance or exhaustive creative direction, as people were tripping over themselves to make quality content for the channel. And, because of the much more dynamic game mechanics that became the norm after Black Ops 2, the trick shots were already leagues more complex and elaborate than they were just a couple of years ago. And soon, the success of FaZe grew far larger than the niche of competitive online gaming, where it took its first baby steps. How much money they were already making at this point is unknown, but according to Temper himself, they weren't making that much besides their partnership deals with Machinima and G Fuel. As he puts it, we were kids running this organization. We were a massive organization with zero organization. By 2015, FaZe had attracted the attention of Hubrick, a social media platform from Norway. To say that FaZe just piqued its interest is a bit of an understatement, though, because Sebastian Gertz, the CEO of Hubrick, decided to fly Temper out to Norway personally so that they could talk about turning FaZe from a successful channel into a solidified brand and household name. Thanks to this investment into FaZe, both financially and creatively speaking, FaZe's recruitment strategy began targeting already established top esports players. By doing this, they acquired G2, an already prominent esports collective, and turned it into FaZe CS. Go. The video introducing the new team, which would operate independently from the original FaZe clan that worked mainly Call of Duty titles, now has over 2 million views. Yet another big chunk of the FPS market was now being targeted, and soon after the team began its activity, FaZe had a CSGO trophy under its belt. It seemed like their dominance would keep growing indefinitely. Because of his massive investment, which turned FaZe into a much more professional organization, Hubrick now held certain power over it and decided to put some of their guys in to oversee the operations and ensure that the brand is well taken care of. To do this, they had Temper step down from his position as CEO and brought in a man named Lee Trink. 
the former EVP and general manager of Virgin Records America, which as far as record labels go is one of the most prestigious ones, having people like Taylor Swift and Shawn Mendes signed to them. Given the caliber of professionals that were coalescing around FaZe, it was clear that everyone in the team had massively lowballed the potential of the brand. Shrink himself said that the buzz around the esports scene was disproportionately large compared to the money actually in it, meaning despite drawing a gigantic amount of attention, it didn't necessarily convert to cash. To be fair, this problem wasn't exclusive to the esports communities and easily applied to online content and media in general, as the more legacy monetization mechanisms took a while to start taking it seriously, but these guys were smart enough to notice the potential it did have. As a matter of fact, they were so ahead of the game that there was even an express interest in making long-form content, which many took years to realize was where the actual money was at. I mean, to this day, there are people grinding away on YouTube to post content that's just too short when it comes to time to maximize its potential for reward. Not to go to uh, Mr. Beast on you guys, but it's really noteworthy that FaZe was being handled with some degree of competence. At least, it seemed to really pay off for his members, who had no shortage of demonstrations of just how well paid they were. FaZe Rain, for example, posted a video in 2017 of his brand new McLaren 570, which was worth just short of $200,000. By the end of 2016, they moved their headquarters from their New York house to a larger one in Los Angeles, and the tour video that accompanied it did numbers, much like every other piece of content that got uploaded to their channel. It was evident that the house was expensive, and a sign that there had been a major upgrade to the scale of FaZe. Regardless, people still largely largely identified with the FaZe members and were happy that they had grown to such magnitudes. Besides Lee Trink, a new addition to the FaZe managerial team was Greg Selko, founder of Karma Loop, which, if you didn't know, was a major streetwear e-commerce company founded in the year 2000. Temper's objective from the beginning was to work on making gaming more fashionable by associating it with things like sports and rap music, which were his personal interests and the lifestyle that he, along with the rest of FaZe, began exhibiting as soon as it became financially viable. It's safe to say that he got exactly what he was aiming at. After a few close calls and high prestige championships, in 2017, the FaZe CSGO team won the E-League and netted a total of half a million dollars in winnings. In the same year, FaZe Banks, who up until this point was primarily occupied with supporting the pre-existing FaZe operations, decided to take the idea of pivoting to other kinds of content seriously, and when he moved to LA, he started the influencer group called The Cloud House, along with fellow YouTubers Ricegum and Alyssa Violet. While the regularly scheduled programming at the FaZe channel took timid, even if successful, steps toward doing things like challenge videos, Banks and The Cloud House went all out into the high octane, and consequently, drama laid inside of YouTube. Soon after, Banks also acquired the two houses adjacent to the original Cloud House and bragged on Twitter that he was paying $100,000 a month on rent. Now, at this point, people's empathy for Banks and his overall relatability began to wear a bit thin, considering the kind of people he was associating with and the attitude he was adopting as the content on his channel slowly split away from mainline phase and more towards clout and drama really just towards rice gum, which I did a whole video about, but uh, you guys know what happened there. As was par for the course for this era of YouTube, they all instantly began beefing with Jake Paul and Team 10. Team 10, remember that? It feels like a lifetime ago, honestly. If you've never actively thought about why it was so customary for YouTubers to click up and beef with each other, the reason is that it was extremely profitable and probably continues to be as far as I can tell. In practice, you get two massive fan bases to collide and interlace with each other because, well, their favorite content creator is having a spat with someone else's favorite content content creator. Sure, there's always an amount of overlap in the fandoms, but then again, there's plenty of people being introduced to the other person's content because of the drama, and as long as it's petty and meaningless conflict, there's no real negative to it. Now, I don't want to be completely cynical about it since it's a sensitive topic, but considering how insensitively it was treated by the people involved, I have to point out how performative it all seems. Basically, in 2017, Jake Paul posted a video saying that his assistant, Meg Zelly, was assaulted by FaZe Banks. Though this video has since been taken down, it was uploaded so that we can see that this very serious allegation was packed into the same video as Jake complaining that his dog took a sh on his Tesla. Meg was assaulted uh, by a man last night who is in the same like community and space as us. And Apollo pooped all over him. Look at this. Now I'm out here cleaning. I'm out here scrubbing, kids. This is what you do for your pets. Banks replied with about as much seriousness as can be expected. And honestly, I don't even think it's worth it to get into the details of this situation as much as it's worth it to observe Rice Gum frantically do his signature gestures and body language like he has hip hop Tourette's. <laughs> Soon after, Logan joined in, Banks made a video called Meeting Jake Paul in Person, uh, in which he does not actually meet Jake Paul in person. Shocking, I know. 
Then, a member of Team 10 who supposedly witnessed everything that happened the night the assault allegedly took place did an interview with Banks, exonerating him of all the accusations. For a while, even though it was settled, the whole thing lived on as a barnacle on the Jake Paul versus Rice Gum beef that was going on. Eventually, it culminated in a drama alert episode into a full-on Clout Gang versus Team 10, with Banks making a follow-up call-out video, with legacy commentary video transitions that uh, I feel oddly nostalgic for, and I honestly like to this day, even though I'm well aware that they are garbage. Without further ado, let's get into it. What the hell does Rick and Morty have to do with anything? Like, why is Rick here? Why is Morty here? Why are they sitting on the couch? Why, <laughs> why is this here? Speaking of the devil himself, Keemstar went on to participate in other FaZe members' videos, such as FaZe Sensors, teaching Keemstar how to work out. Regardless of how stupid and trashy all of this stuff seems now that we're looking back at it, it pretty much ran YouTube for a good while. While all of this was going on, the OG FaZe Clan channel was still grinding out its usual content like always, even going as far as playing Call of Duty with Lil Yachty, who, at the time, was one of the biggest people when it came to trending rap. Their goal of diversifying the content to get attention from as many places as possible simultaneously was a massive success, and the fruits of their labor soon made themselves manifest. As in 2018, FaZe opened its A-Series funding round, which is finance sell jargon for becoming available for private investors that want to chip in. This move proved extremely popular as the list of investors was star-studded from top to bottom. Multiple A-list musicians including Pitbull, multiple basketball players, skateboarders, music executives, radio hosts, actors, and even Jimmy Lovine himself, the co-founder of Interscope Records, which is one of the biggest labels ever, to put it mildly, put money in. All in all, the investments totaled 40 mil, which meant that faith in the success of FaZe was at an all-time high. To top it all off, in January of 2020, they received an extra $22 million from a Canadian investment firm called Canaccord Genuity. But while their bottom line was ironclad on the more financial and corporate end, they began suffering a few costs in the PR department. Initially, Banks' move to become the YouTuber face of face was very rewarding, as he did vlogs with Ninja and continued to milk his connections with Rice Gum, as well as Jake and Logan Paul, for as many views as he possibly could. And I don't even blame him. However, being this public meant that, along with raking in benefits, you'd also have to deal with the possible downsides of the exposure. One of the people that Banks regularly collabed with, Turner, or Tfu as he was known online, filed a lawsuit against FaZe Clan claiming that he was stuck in an oppressive contract that he wanted out of. The details include Tfu having to kick up 80% of his revenue from online streaming, as well as half of everything he makes from touring and real-life appearances to FaZe. He also claims that, after being pressured to move into the Hollywood FaZe house, he was given alcohol and was encouraged to gamble all before he turned 21. This greatly upset Banks, who immediately recorded and posted a video commenting on the situation, expressing how upset he was that he got got no heads up about the lawsuit despite considering Tifu not just a business partner, but a close friend whom he considered family. On top of this, he made light of Tifu's allegations of being pressured into drinking, as there was a video of him drinking when he was 20 while not in the face house at all. The point of Banks' video, which seems noticeably a lot more serious and far less performative than any of his other drama videos, was not that Tifu was a bad person, but that given Banks' history of going out of his way to help him out, this matter should have been settled out of court and behind the cameras. It's worth noting that after the response to Tifu, Banks stopped uploading altogether, and that trend has persisted today, three years later. Tifu's reply was short and blunt, focusing primarily on his contract with FaZe Clan and how purportedly abusive it is. In this video, he repeatedly asked for permission to show his audience the contracts themselves, which according to him were self-evidently exploitative. Another FaZe representative, Seabass, came forward and addressed Tifu's concerns in a video where they reveal that, as the management changed over the years, FaZe had already attempted to renegotiate Tifu's contract with him many times so that the terms wouldn't be as bad as even they recognized them to be. Seabass claims that, during these negotiations, Tifu ranged from uncooperative to outright unresponsive. Now, while it's certainly noteworthy that FaZe didn't just leave Tifu out to dry and actually try to figure out a better agreement, it is a bit of an obfuscation from their side to neglect the facts that the bottom line was that they didn't want to let Tifu leave FaZe under any circumstance because he was just too profitable for them. Of course, the excuse given was that they thought the fans deserved better, but over time it became clear that letting Tifu simply leave was something they never intended to even consider, because that meant losing one of their main assets. 
Seabass claimed that FaZe had collected about 60 grand from their percentages on Tfue's partnerships, while Tfue himself made millions. But this didn't remedy the problem that Tfue was bringing up in the first place. FaZe's official reaction then crystallized into a counter-lawsuit, claiming he had earned over $20 million from streaming and hadn't shared any of it with FaZe, despite being contractually obliged to do so. The suit was also alleging that the campaign over-revealing the contract caused extensive damages to FaZe's public image and did not respect their agreement that Tfue would keep his terms with FaZe confidential. Last but not least, FaZe was claiming that Tfue's objective with all of it was to lay the groundwork for a rival esports company of his own, which again, would be a massive violation of his contract, which basically forbade him from doing so. This was because around the same time Tfue was leaving, his main partner in the organization, Dennis Lepore, or Cloaksy, was also leaving, and they promptly moved to New Jersey together. However, when asked about this on Twitter, he claimed his departure from FaZe had nothing to do with Tfue, despite the timing. Tfue's lawyer responded to the lawsuit, saying, FaZe Clan's lawsuit in New York is a ridiculous and obvious attempt to avoid the consequences of its clear violations of California law. Filing the lawsuit in New York is actually an admission that FaZe Clan has no defense to these violations of California law. Ask yourself, why is FaZe Clan afraid to litigate its wrongful conduct in California? The answer is obvious. FaZe Clan will lose. In the New York lawsuit, FaZe Clan actually admits to violating California's Talent Agencies Act by procuring employment without a license. Equally egregious is the fact that FaZe Clan is suing Turner under its illegal contract for the monies it publicly represented that it was not collecting. This is the first time in the history of esports that an organization has had the audacity to try and enforce contractual provisions that are so clearly illegal against one of its gamers. However you cut it, this is a terrible situation for all parties involved, but ultimately, Tfue had every right to want out of his relationship, even if he did sign the contract and agree to the terms. There's no clear conclusion to draw from this besides the fact that corporate attitudes and contracts tend to be very antithetical to organic, healthy relationships, but I digress. The fallout from this very public conflict was extremely detrimental to FaZe at a period when PR was of utmost importance since they were trying to raise capital to establish the brand. Immediately following the breaking of this news, it was revealed that FaZe had signed a player called Heisky when he was just 11 years old and pressured him to lie about his age since the rules clearly established that players below the age of 13 couldn't be admitted into FaZe. Regardless of this rough patch, the rest of the year 2020 was looking pretty good for FaZe. Since their business mostly relied on operations that didn't require anyone to leave their house, they went by mostly unscathed through the pandemic. In March, they dropped a video revealing the new FaZe house, which was worth a whopping $30 million, and at this point, the disconnect in the content was becoming blatant, as it felt less like FaZe and more like Jake Paul with a gamer overcoat. If you were to look at the uploads from this period, there would often be multiple consecutive non-gaming uploads of just vlog and lifestyle content, and when there was gaming stuff, it would be Fortnite, which despite still being really popular, felt a lot more like following what was trending as opposed to innovating, or what made FaZe what it was, which was COD. But despite some people disliking it, anything FaZe did was extremely popular, and profitable. By June, they announced their co-partnership of Drink Control, a company that made meal replacement high-calorie drinks, which was very much an on-brand move as far as marketing it to gamers considering some guys will go as far as pee in bottles so that they don't have to make trips to the bathroom while trickshotting. I'm sure offering this demographic a way to drink their meals instead of having to go through the hassle of eating is an easy sell. By the end of the year, FaZe Clan was reportedly worth over $300 million, and its revenue was estimated by Forbes to be $40 million, ranking them as the fourth most valuable esports company in the world. One of their many endeavors that they invested in was FaZe Studios, which was created to produce movies under the FaZe brand. Their first film production was called Crimson, a horror movie about FaZe Rug moving into a house without knowing creepy haunted clowns live next door. Yeah, not exactly uh, breaking the stereotype of YouTube content creators making consistently terrible ventures into the film industry. Nevertheless, it's pretty hilarious to think that there's a full-on horror movie out there that stars FaZe Rug and is edited like a FaZe vlog but with spooky music in the background. Some movie critic channel should watch it and make a video about it. You guys should have dollar signs in your eyes. Now, to their credit, they also have other productions, such as a reality show for Quibi centered around a recruitment contest for FaZe. Regardless of how silly some of the extremities of the FaZe brand had become, the money these guys were moving on the regular was anything but. By June of 2021, they got featured on Sports Illustrated, which was pretty major considering that, at that point, no other esports conglomerate had achieved that feat. That same year, FaZe was orienting itself towards becoming a publicly traded company, and to do that, it would merge with the special purpose acquisition investors B. Riley Principal, which as far as financial companies go, was about as straightforward and boring as they come. So it was a bit surprising that they'd be willing to go out on a limb and merge with FaZe of all things, but that really just shows the money they were taking in. The expected initial valuation of FaZe when it entered NASDAQ was the surprising figure of 1 
billion dollars, a major leap from their previous valuations. Just in the process of merging, they would be getting 291 million from B. Riley and would be renamed into Phase Holdings Incorporated. I guess because it gave them more credibility as a company than Clan. When speaking about this very major move towards a much more cut and dry corporate version of Phase, Lee Trank said, "In our short history, we've evolved from a disruptive content generator to one of the world's most decorated and successful esports franchises, and now into one of the younger generation's most recognized and followed brands globally. We believe Phase Clan is becoming the voice of youth culture, a brand that sits at the nexus of content, gaming, entertainment, and lifestyle in the digital native world. This transaction will provide us both capital and access to public markets, which will help us accelerate the expansion of our multi-platform and monetization strategy." While all of this did seem very solid, it painted a very different picture of Phase than what people came to expect, especially considering the kind of antics the members were still regularly getting into. I mean, one of the company's board of directors was none other than Snoop Dogg, although what his actual involvement in the company is, is unknown. I suspect it was nothing. In July of 2021, the merger was finalized with FaZe and B. Riley, but with a valuation of $725 million instead of the original billion. While still an insane figure, it led people to wonder if this drop in value came as a consequence of FaZe's structure being less financially concrete than it presented itself to be. Another thing that raised widespread doubts about FaZe's financial regularity was the fact that in 2021, FaZe K became one of the main representatives of the infamous Save the Kids crypto scam. Other FaZe members that got involved were Jarvis, Tico, and and Nikan, who were all suspended from FaZe for their involvement in the scam, while K was outright kicked. A year after their deal with B. Riley was finalized, FaZe finally went public, and the company's value immediately began going down. From its all-time high of $20 per share, within two months, it dropped to a measly $4, which meant things were looking extremely grim. Partially, this is because it was revealed that FaZe was promised $100 million worth of private investments during the process of going public, but after it went public, it got less than $30 million, which was a major red flag and made a a lot of people lose faith in the value of FaZe. Though it's a little complicated and financy to explain, government filings reveal that FaZe had defaulted on $74 million worth of its investments, and over 90% of the investors chose to get a cash payout immediately after the company went public, which drained almost $200 million from the company's value and made it look like a quick cash grab for savvy investors. But ultimately, FaZe was destined to crash and burn. It was during the same time that FaZe announced its metaverse project, FaZe World, though there hasn't yet been a sign they went anywhere with this, and as far as we know, it's languishing and forgotten in some phase office. Fortunately, they had plenty of other endeavors, such as a partnership with DC Comics to produce and publish an issue of Batman that included prominent members of FaZe as superheroes? Strange. The business side of FaZe was so prioritized that they were even willing to forget their rivalry with another esports organization, such as Optic Gaming, so that they could work on selling merch together. Streetwear Company Network, basically a store that is only open temporarily, which drives up the rarity and value of the items sold. It was called The Armory, and it stayed open from May to June of 2022 in Fairfax, LA, which is one of the most disputed and popular locations in California. Besides selling merchandise, the venue would also be used to host gaming championships. But despite their best efforts, and for reasons that aren't exactly easy to understand, their stock value just continued to sink to deeper and deeper lows. By January 2023, the price dropped to below a dollar. This is particularly bad news because the whole point of making phase into phase holdings was to have it on NASDAQ. But if a stock stays below a dollar for over a month, it gets hit with something called a notice of delisting, which means you have 180 days to get the price up to a dollar or more, or your stock gets delisted. By February, the stock hovered at around 75 cents, and by March, they got the notice of delisting. And it really doesn't look like it's going to go to the moon anytime soon. So their efforts to make FaZe into some kind of Nike are probably going to fail. Lee Trink, the CEO of FaZe, claimed that they had enough money to keep them afloat until November of 2023, but this could just mean that the company is on borrowed time and barely making ends meet, and will literally come apart the moment that time comes. It's odd because the same month the stock price dipped below $1, FaZe announced that they signed a multi-year partnership with none other than Porsche, which is one of, if not the most distinguished car company, period. Within a month of this, one-fifth of FaZe's staff was laid off, supposedly because of the economy, but most likely because of the company being in dire straits. Though at one point, the main FaZe channel was always putting out a bunch of videos of both gaming and lifestyle content, now it was limited to posting once a month and focusing almost exclusively on their collaborations with other celebrities and YouTubers, such as Mr. Beast and Jadid. On. Sure, when they did upload, the numbers weren't terrible, but the content felt void of any identity and personality. It felt like it was being made out of obligation. Notwithstanding, some of the most important members of FaZe that originally drew a lot of people into the content were now mostly absent. For a long time, people have been commenting that they missed the old FaZe and expressed their fears that the brand would be swallowed up by the corporate side of things, something that many claim happened to older YouTube brands like Smosh. Now, every single one of those fears came true, and the organization was a shell of what
what it once was. Before the stock price was even in danger of being delisted by the end of 2022, FaZe Rain was already speaking out about the corruption of FaZe with a massively positive reaction from the community. For a while, Rain was alone in this struggle against FaZe and what it had become, but in March of 2023, a video from another member, Tico, came out. In it, Tico explains that despite publicly defending FaZe during their friction with Tifu over the contracts, Tico's own contract was still the same one that Tifu was trying to escape from, and FaZe never did anything to change that. To make matters worse, FaZe often neglected whatever Tico was up to as far as representing FaZe, often leaving him to his own devices and making him pay for his trips to game contests, as well as showing complete incompetence to do things as simple as coordinating merch with Tico, feeding him false promises and consistently letting them fall through. However, one thing they never failed to do according to Tico was charge him for 20% of everything he did, despite offering no significant help whatsoever. In a way, FaZe is bigger than it ever was, but it's also smaller than it ever was. All of these collabs that we were doing with really, really big brands, you know what it is to me? All of these collabs that's coming out, it's like Band-Aid or silver tape on internal bleeding. That's the way I see it. And they think talent don't matter, they think that we don't matter because they think that they can do everything because they see the FaZe logo as the Nike logo and they can just do whatever they want. But there's no depth to it. There's no substance there. There's nothing behind that FaZe logo backing it. There's no culture anymore. That's what these people don't understand. The community was deeply supportive of Tico standing up against FaZe, and Rain also came out in his defense, reacting to his video and backing up everything he was saying. For the brunt of FaZe's original following, this felt like a breath of fresh air and a light at the end of the tunnel as far as FaZe potentially returning to his essence. Back when Tifu first came out, there was a lot of controversy as to who was in the right, but now it became clearer than ever that the people running FaZe were asleep at the wheel in the best case scenario. Later on in the month, a video came out of Rain and Tico meeting up to discuss FaZe, which again got people's hopes up for a real FaZe revival on the horizon. FaZe also reacted to Seabass, the member who originally spoke up against Tifu over the contracts, trying to pull the same maneuver as Tico, saying that he should be thankful to have a roof over his head. This is absurd, since without the members like Tico that built the brand from the ground up, the corporate overhead that they're working to sustain have nothing going for them. When going over FaZe's official response to the situation, FaZe Rain stumbled upon an interaction between Mr. Beast and the FaZe Clan account on Twitter, wherein Mr. Beast says that when he visited the FaZe headquarters, they had no idea how to make a good piece of content. When the most successful and prolific YouTuber in the world is telling you that, you should probably listen. Soon after Tico connected with Rain, he also posted a video saying he was going to move in with fellow FaZe member Rug. Other than this bubble of activity, other FaZe members have stayed pretty much silent on the matter, even if they do occasionally admit the company has a serious problem. FaZe Temper has been mostly preoccupied with his boxing events such as his fight with KSI. However, he appears in a picture posted to FaZe Banks' Twitter with the caption, Up to Something, which further promoted hopes of a FaZe resurgence. Banks himself, just recently addressed the situation on Twitter, saying, I don't know what all these corporate f**ks think they're doing, weighing options, plotting, doing whatever the f**k it is they've been doing, but the answer is very simple. Give us our brand back, you stole it in the first place. It goes to zero otherwise. You have no idea what phase is. When confronted by people who were posting that the current state of FaZe was, at least partially, Banks' fault for signing it over to the people who ruined the brand, he replied, Never signed anything. My shares were stolen very early in FaZe Clan's development and were only reinstated one and a half years ago. Fun fact, my shares were legitimately stolen from me in 2016. I was written out of the company. They were only reinstated right before it was taken public. Point being, I legally haven't had any say in how this company operates or the decisions it's made for the majority of its existence. Because of his otherwise complete silence on this matter, whether for contractual obligations or other reasons, it's unclear what he's referring to here. What is safe to say, however, is that a consensus is taking place that FaZe is not in good hands and is due for a reconstruction. Who knows, maybe we'll be in for another decade's worth of good content. Or maybe FaZe Clan is bound for the floor. Regardless, I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, phase up and leave me alone.